This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. On a tomb in the graveyard of St Anne's Church in London, there's an inscription that reads, The first unanswered metaphysician of the age a despiser of the merely rich and great, a lover of the people, poor or oppressed, a hater of the pride and power of the few, the unconquered champion of truth, liberty and humanity. The essayist and critic William Hazlitt was buried in 1830. By some he was described as the Shakespeare prose writer of our glorious country, yet his rebellious Republican views led him to be demonised and ridiculed by the Regency elite. Hazlitt's writing was as wide-ranging as his interests. She brought the same energy and focus to essays on boxing and racquetball as he did to those on Shakespeare. What's less well known is that he began his career as a painter and a philosopher. However, his unrequited infatuation with his landlady's daughter and the memoir in which he revealed this led him into disgrace and he died in poverty. His reputation as an intellectual is still recovering. With me to discuss the turbulent life and works of William Hazlitt are Anthony Grayling, Professor of Philosophy at Birkbeck College, University of London, Uttara Natarajan, Senior Lecturer in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at Goldsmiths College, University of London, and Jonathan Bate, Professor of English Literature at the University of Warwick. Jonathan Bate, can you give us a sense of William Hazlitt's family, background, and the effect it had on his ideas. Yeah, he was born into an Ulster dissenting family, actually born at Maidstone um, in, the, in, in Kent. And the key fact of uh, his, his background, his upbringing, was that his father was um, a dissenting minister. He was a Unitarian, um, so he's involved with the, the non-established church, and immediately that has very strong links with politics in the period. Um, early in um, Hazlitt's childhood, there was a, a falling out, uh, really for sort of political reasons, uh, within the, uh, the congregation of his father, uh, as a result of which um, his father went to America for a time and became one, one of the first Unitarian ministers in America. Um, then back to England um, and started a ministry um, on, on the Welsh borders, a little town called Wem, just out, outside Shrewsbury. Um, but as I say, the key fact um, is that Hazlitt's father um, is a preacher and a political radical and indeed um, publishes, publishes his sermons and so forth. And being a Unitarian, he didn't believe that Christ was the son of God, but Christ was a great moral teacher. And this barred the young Hazlitt from education at the ancient universities. So at 15, he went to Hackney College, a college set up by descendants, in which he got a far better education, so all three of you here today claim, than he would have got at Oxford or Cambridge. Yeah, this is one of the really interesting things about the links between um, radical uh, thinkers in the 18th century um, and, and religion. It, the only established university Universities were Oxford and Cambridge in England. To go there, you had to, si you had to sign up to the Articles of Faith of the Church of England. If you were a dissenter, you wouldn't do that. So the dissenters set up their own academies. There was a very famous one at Warrington, was one of the first ones where, where the great um, Joseph Priestley um, was, was teaching for a time. And then um, Hackney became the, the, the real sort of centre of dissenting education in London. Now, in the 18th century, education at Oxford and Cambridge was very much in the sort of, you know, Aristotelian logic of the Middle Ages and above all in the classical languages. Whereas at these dissenting academies, you, you would study contemporary literature, you'd study Shakespeare, history, geography, a much more rounded... And contemporary curriculum. politics, I understand. Indeed, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So a much more rounded and contemporary curriculum. And this was crucial in, in shaping Hazlitt. After a brief uh, attempt um, following his brother to be a painter, and he... It, I, I'm sure everybody around this table likes some of his portrait paintings very much indeed. He, he, um, he studied philosophy, uh, and can you tell us a little about that, Jonathan, and then go into this first meeting with Coleridge? Yeah, um, he, his older brother John uh, became quite a successful portrait painter, especially of min miniatures, and uh, to begin with, um, Hazlitt thought he, he would follow in his brother's footsteps. 
Um, and there are some very, very fine paintings by him. There's a wonderful painting um, in the National Portrait Gallery of his friend Charles Lamb, uh, Charles Lamb looking like a Venetian senator. Hazlitt, as a painter, um, was very, very influenced by Titian um, in 1802 when the, the war with France came to a, a temporary cessation. He was able to go to Paris and start copying portraits in, in the Louvre. And uh, he said that uh, Titian's portrait of a, a, of a young man with a glove in black absolutely shaped his idea of what a great portrait was like. Um, later, then, you, then you studied he, philosophy. Sorry then, to hurry you yeah. along, but you've got a lot to do. Yeah. Then you studied philosophy. Then he, yeah. he, stu he studied philosophy, um, and he thought that he had come up with a really original philosophical idea. Anthony, I'm sure, will tell us it's not as original as Hazlitt claimed it was. But in 1808, um, he, he published his, his first work, a, a work of philosophy called An Essay on the Principles of Human Action. And after that essay which Anthony can tell us a little more in a moment, he set off as a journalist, an uh, essayist, and met Coleridge. In fact, he walked ten miles on a raw morning to hear Coleridge speech, sp give a sermon, speak a sermon, and that was uh, the sacred year of 1798. 1798, yeah. I mean, the... the the, con the, the chronology is a bit confusing here because he, he wrote the essay a lot later. The essay is called My First Acquaintance yes. with Poets. And it's about the year 1798, where Hazlitt is 20, so he's just on, on the threshold of, uh, of, of, of adulthood. Um, and Coleridge, um, himself a, a preacher, comes to preach at Hazlitt's father's church. And um, Hazlitt is absolutely enchanted by this figure of Coleridge, the great thinker, the great poet, um, and ha Hazlitt feels that he's, he, he's in touch with new ideas and a, a new sense of every aspect of intellectual life coming together. And Coleridge pre preaching on truth and genius, although he turned on him savagely later, that is Hazlitt on Coleridge, and the other way around. Anthony Grayling, first of all about this philosophy, and then Hazlitt's take view of the French Revolution, which broke out in 1789. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, in fact, it is an original idea in Hazlitt. I'd like to defend him on, on that one, although it came out of a debate in the 18th century about uh, personal identity and the continuity of, of personality through time, which had been uh, originated in the preceding, the 17th uh, century, by John Locke. Um, so there had been considerable discussion about this, and the discussion focused on the fact that traditionally, of course, people thought we had immaterial souls which persist through all the vicissitudes of ordinary life and that's what survives death. But the Unitarians, uh, like um, William's father and the great uh, uh, Joseph Priestley and, uh, and Price, who were principal uh, discussers of this problem, were materialists. That is, they, in the case of Priestley, didn't think that we had a material, immaterial soul and that posed some difficulties because uh, what is it that survives over time given all the physical changes we undergo and what happens at the resurrection? That was the great point. And in the year of, of uh, Hazlitt's birth, 1788 um, uh, I think it was, wasn't it? 78. Priestley and Price published a correspondence they had, had with one another on this very question. And when Hazlitt went to the new college in Hackney uh, in the 1790s, one of his teachers, a man called Belsham, had been uh, a commentator on this discussion. Hazlitt must have uh, discussed it with Belsham and heard lectures on, on the Priestley thesis about um, personal identity. And it was as a result of, of that and of reading the Baron Dolbach on, on the nature of man that he realised uh, that there was a, a very key implication of the idea that our personality is not a matter of an immaterial soul but is a matter as it were of succession of different stages and this is that our future selves don't exist uh, uh, and therefore our relationship to our own future selves is the same as our relationship to anybody else and the importance of that um, insight was that in the 18th century, and even still today indeed, people think that the reason why we do what we do, the basis of our moral action, is our self-interest, is the fact that we put ourselves before anybody else. And has it recognised that if our future selves are on a par with all other selves, then in fact um, the way we act with respect to our future self has the same basis as our action for everybody else. And he called this the natural disinterestedness. Of, uh, of the human mind, and that it is imagination, sympathetic imagination, which connects us with the interests of our future selves and therefore of everybody else, and it's on a par. It's not self-interest which is important, but disinterestedness. 
he pinched a phrase to say that his book of philosophy was still born from the press and hardly anybody read it, but it eventually uh, it influenced certainly what he wrote from then onwards and the way he tackled uh, the subjects he took on. It deeply influenced uh, it, yes, he came to say that um, since metaphysical treatises, and I should just mention by the way that the word metaphysics in has its day meant what we nowadays call philosophy because the word philosophy in has its day meant what we now call science. It's all very confusing, but, but no, metaphysics meant, meant very philosophy. Very straightforward. <laughs> uh, and um, he recognised that uh, a dry, uh, a detailed, analytical treatise was going to reach very, very few readers. It's still true, maybe even more true today than it was in Hazard's own day. And so he wanted to uh, purvey his philosophical insights in popular essays and came, therefore, uh, to, to do that and to say that all, almost all his essays had underneath them uh, some application of one or other of the principles that he had worked out very painfully and over a very long period of time from the 1790s into the uh, first and second decades of the 19th century. He was 11 when the French Revolution broke out. He became a passionate supporter of the French Revolution and more surprisingly he continued to be a supporter after the terror which a lot of his, uh, his then idols, uh, younger idols, Coleridge and Wordsworth being the prime example, ceased to be. He followed Napoleon. Napoleon, to him, had carried through the revolution. The Napoleonic Code was the personification of the best of the exemplification of the best of the revolution. Can you talk to that for a while? Yes, indeed. Well, firstly, of course, the, the revolution caused the most immense excitement all around the, the, the civilized world. Uh, we have reports of people uh, in Moscow and St. Petersburg saying how, you know people of all nationalities had come out on the streets and hugged one another when they heard about the fall of the Bastille. And uh, um, Hazlitt's sister, Peggy, in her memoir, talks about how exhilarated her father, William Hazlitt Sr., was when he heard about the news. So you can imagine this very precocious, very, very bright uh, boy, 11-year-old boy, very close to his father and shared uh, with his father a lot of those social and political principles that he had acquired from him, would have been over the moon at the thought. He said, in fact, that that was the day of his own birth, that his the birth of his consciousness and the birth of liberty were, uh, took place on the same day. And he was true to that, as, as some other people were too. Not everybody was uh, you know, uh, disabused by the terror that happened later on. The principles of the, of the French Revolution were very deeply rooted in the, the whole uh, radical dissenting tradition, which of course was quashed by very repressive laws against them um, in, uh, in the 1790s. And he remained faithful to that, and he believed that Napoleon had uh, uh, um, taken the best of, of those principles. And, you know, when you look at the way Napoleon put down a rabble of kings in Europe, it's a nice joke that has it tells, but somebody said to him that he admired Napoleon for putting down the rabble in the streets of Paris uh, with cannon, you know, grape shot. And um, has it said, uh, no, I admire the way he put down a rabble of kings in Europe and brought the Holy Roman Empire to an end, opened the ghettos uh, and, and enfranchised the Jews. And he was a, a great admirer of Napoleon's. And when Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo much later on, he was drunk for two weeks and then gave up alcohol altogether. So it just shows you how deeply and passionately attached he was to Napoleon. And indeed, we should mention that his last great work at the very end of his life was a, a, a rather a curate's egg of a, of a three-volume biography of Napoleon. But he also admired the code because it gave the rights to citizens. A, n there was no preferment outside merit, uh, and people could come, as it were, from where Napoleon had come from to, 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 to take over the state. Uttara Natarajan, what were the other important philosophical influences at work on Hazlitt? Are we just laying the basis for it before we move on? Well, as, as Anthony said, Hazlitt's um, reaction was against these um, philosophers who grounded all human action in self-interest. And that um, was in turn underpinned by a notion that we're all propelled by our senses. We feel ourselves and the world around us through our senses. So in a way we're trapped by our senses um, because our senses cannot give us any real feeling of anyone else. This is why we naturally act self-interestedly. Hazlitt was therefore naturally drawn to philosophers um, who could counter, I think, these notions of being completely ruled by the senses. Uh, Rousseau's Emile, he says, was, was very much a model for him. Um, Rousseau uh, criticises um, the modern philosophy in, in Emile, uh, the material philosophy, as, as, as Anthony said. Um, he's particularly dismissive of the notion that all our thoughts and feelings can be boiled down to physical impressions. 
Uh, Bishop Barclay, I think, is an important influence too, has several times expressed his great admiration for Barclay. And although he isn't, um, in, in many ways, he discounts um, the... the, the, the uh, ultimate emphases of Barclay's uh, philosophy, he's very attracted to the idea that the mind can control what it perceives. Yeah, but we're not, we're not controlled by, the, by what the external world impacts on the senses, but we in fact can control what we perceive. And a very key influence also, especially on that early essay, is Bishop Butler and the Rolls Chapel sermons. Um, and what's crucial for Hazlitt about Butler is that Butler insists that we can decouple sensory response, sense impressions, from self-interest. Can you unravel that a bit more? I can. Um, Butler says that um, there are all kinds of ways in which when we gratify our senses, we in fact go against our self-interest. For instance, we indulge too much. We might get a bit too drunk, you might eat too many sweets, um, and actually you know that it's bad for you, but you do it anyway. So sensual gratification is not, clearly not the same thing as self-interested behaviour. We can separate um, self-interest, which is a more abstract thing from sens um, sensual gratification and that, the, that abstract thing, self-interest is driven by wanting some sort of benefit, a good and this is Hazlitt's key point in the essay he says that whether we act on our own behalf whether we act on behalf of somebody else what we want is a benefit or a good what drives us is a love of good and not a love of self out of all his influences, because he, he did take contradictory influences, he was a great yes. supporter of the French Revolution, and yet he was a great admirer of Edmund Burke, the conservative, uh, magnificent orator and writer who was very much strongly against the French Revolution. So it went on. What was, did the melting pot of his mind never stop melting, or did he come to some kind of resolution? Hazlitt prided himself, I would say, on his own consistency. Um, he... Um, he, he, he very much um, in later life uh, declared that you know, his ideas hadn't changed very much from when he was 16. Um, so I think, um, I think what he's doing is engaging with different philosophers and adapting from them um, ideas which conduce to his own thesis, which is that everything is imaginative. Um, and yes, I think it does all come together. Anthony Grayling, he wrote another book, uh, and uh, after the essay on the principles of human action, he wrote a book, Free Thoughts on Public Affairs, but I want to get towards his essays, and we've, we've announced this as the greatest essay in the English language, and the sooner we get onto that, the better. But as a final point, uh, from what Andra said then, do we, are we talking about someone whose essays, whose ideas that he worked out, as you say, painfully in a, over a long term, about the place of the imagination, as well as the place of reason, uh, these are the two, as if we can pick out two, two guiding lights. Yes, f first let me just uh, mention that, uh, um, of course, in addition to the essay on the principles of human action, he published a number of other things, uh, and did a number of other things that were specifically philosophical. I mean, right up until 1812, just before he became a, a parliamentary reporter for the, new the Chronicle newspaper. Um, one, one was uh, a redaction and edition of the uh, great seven-volume work by a man called Abraham Tucker called uh, The Light of Nature Revealed. Um, and another was a set of lectures that he gave, his very first lectures in 1812 on the history of English philosophy, which is fascinating from the point of view of the fact that what we now uh, think of when we look back across the landscape of 17th and 18th century uh, British philosophy, we think, uh, you know, Locke, Great, Berkeley, slightly less important, Hume, Great, and so on, um, with the exception of Hume, um, what Hazard did was to reverse those judgments. He had a very poor opinion of Locke, who he thought had plagiarised plagiarized Hobbes, and he was a great admirer of Berkeley, who is a, a wonderful thinker. Um, so he devoted a very, very great deal of time to the study, the deep study of, of philosophy, and uh, close attention to the texts of contemporary and, and recent philosophers, as in the case of, of Abraham Tucker. And so what one has to grant that uh, everything that he wrote after that time, all his essays, float on, on, a, on a deep ocean of good, uh, profound philosophical understanding. And as you read those essays and, and go through them, and of course... 
they're so magical and wonderful, as we'll we come on to l later, that you uh, are swept along by them. But if you pause over them, you notice that these philosophical ideas, these impulses, philosophical impulses, are there and inform everything that he writes. Well, let's get to the essay. Jonathan Bate. Uh, he, he's taken on by the Morning Chronicle. He starts writing the essays. Can you give the listener, the listeners who are about to rush out and buy a house, that we all have, uh, a taste, if they haven't got it already, um, a taste of what, what, what began to... What did struck people about him? Because he... And we, well, he began, as Anthony said, actually as a parliamentary reporter. Um, that didn't well, last did. too long. Um, because what happened was, early in 1814... Um, the theatre critic of the newspaper uh, left and, uh, and Hazlitt was propelled into the job of being the theatre reviewer. And it was really with his theatre reviews that uh, his, his essay writing style began to take off. So over the following year, sort of 1814 through the rest of the Regency years, um, he, he starts writing essays um, for many different magazines and newspapers on all sorts of different themes. And I think the great thing to, uh, to, to have a sense of with Hazlitt is that he had this wonderfully capacious, hungry imagination. He would write about anything. Well, let's give us some... Can you give us a scattergun resume of what he'd write about? Well, he would write I mean, about... the post office. He'd Maybe write a about... boxing match. Yeah, he'd... he'd Coburn, exactly. Well, you're doing it for us now. No, I mean, for me, the, the brilliance of Hazard is, is that whether he is writing um, an essay about a Shakespearean tragedy or about some Indian jugglers performing on the street, whether he's writing about John Kavanagh, the fives player, or Malthus's essay on population. He approaches it with the same energy. One of his great words is gusto. Gusto, he says, is power or passion defining an object. Um, he, he, he looks at his experience, the world around him, the politics around him, his memories of the past, and he animates everything with extraordinary gusto. Can I come back to you, Ottera, for a moment? He, running through his criticism is his notion of genius. Mm. Can you tell us what he meant by genius? Absolutely. What seems to me very interesting about Hassel's idea of genius is that um, there emerge quite distinctly two kinds of genius in Hassel's writing. One is Shakespeare. Shakespeare to Hazlitt um, is the kind of genius which can become anything at all. Um, Shakespeare I must remember that. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Sorry. It's not rude, Doug. I hope it's helpful. No? But as, at that time, Shakespeare was not thought of as the, the great national bard. He was well thought of, but he'd been plagiarised, he'd been amended and so on. He wasn't the supreme figure, and Hazlitt was very instrumental with Coleridge of pushing him forward in that way. Absolutely. I think um, Hazlitt was, was key to, to the reception of Shakespeare in his time. So his Shakespeare criticism is also um, developing in response to, to Keane's performances, which he's going to, to look at. And his notion of Shakespeare... Uh, is, is, is a genius which can become any character that it represents. It's a protean genius, he calls it. But then Simon, That's without ego as well. It's, that it is, matters exactly. That it, it contrasts yeah. it with Wordsworth, who is ego. Uh, exactly uh, right. It is about Wordsworth. Exactly and, right, uh, yeah. Um, he has a notion of Shakespearean genius which uh, has no self. Um, but side by side with that, he has examples of genius. You mentioned Wordsworth, who he admires but is also quite antipathetic to in some respects. A better example is Milton. Milton, he says, is a kind, is what he calls an ordinary genius. But it's a kind of genius which functions through asserting a very, very strong ego. Now, it's curious, but it actually says a great deal for English culture, and I'm using the word English here, that he makes his big reputation by being a theatre critic. Uh, uh, and in, in a time of bankruptcy, awful winter, terrible times, Drury Lane's going to close, this young boy, or young man, uh, Edmund Keane, is playing um, Shylock, in the Merchant of Venice, of course, has the ghost to see it, and is entranced by it, infatuated, and writes as such. And he, he, he saves the theatre. Jane Austen writes saying, I must get in after reading this. I can't get any tickets. So can you just give us his reaction to that and why you think it struck that nerve? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really was the case that there was a, a, a wonderful piece of good fortune that Keane arrived as 
actor at exactly the moment Hazlitt arrived as critic, and they sort of made each other's reputations and transformed the theatre. What, what Hazlitt loved about Keane was the, 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 the energy, the sense of throwing himself into the role. But he also liked the fact that Keane, I mean, he was, he was provincial, working class, and illegitimate child. He had come from nowhere, and yet he could take on these great parts for kings like Richard III. And also, um, Shylock, the fact that Shylock was one of the first roles with which Keane made his reputation. Shylock, the Jew, the outsider, yet the character who appeals to universal human sympathy, hath not a Jew eyes, and so on. It's Keane's performance, and then Hazlitt's mediation of that performance to the public through his review, is the first moment where people begin to see that Shylock is a deeply humane character, that Shakespeare has not written an anti-Semitic play, that Shylock is in many ways the most sympathetic character in the play. And note that word sympathy. That's the idea, going back to the essay on the principles of human action, the idea of sympathising, empathising with the point of view of another. That's what an actor can do. An actor can become another person. Can and, we know and just the connection there, Melvin, with, uh, with this idea of negative capability or the, the idea of being able to occupy almost any viewpoint as Shakespeare could? Can that, you that just universal a, a, genius. explain negative capability? Well, well a it's, a, it's just the, 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 a term I think a Keats came up with yeah, because yeah, Keats yeah. was a huge admirer of Hazlitt and, and he latched onto this idea that Hazlitt was so keen on the idea of being able to occupy multiple points of view sympathetically and to represent them. And this, of course, is what a really fine actor can do. This is what the theatre does. And this is why it's out of uh, uh, has this theatre criticism that y you get perhaps the best example of the application of this idea of the, the, the universalizing genius. I notice, to my horror, that there isn't a copy of Hazlitt's essays on this table, but can you give listeners some idea of what he was saying about Keane that, that infatuated, that caught the imaginations of people like Jane Austen, the London theatre going public, and saved an entire theatre from bankruptcy? Anybody... Any, I feel like bidding, yeah? <laughs> well, I, I think it's because uh, in the review, in, in that crucial review, which, by the way, he was accused of having been paid by the theatre to write because it did save the theatre from bankruptcy and the rest, but, but in it uh, you, you, you get a, a match between the gusto... And uh, Jonathan's quite right, this is the key aesthetic term of criticism that, uh, that has to use about painting as well as about theatre and about writing in general, even about ideas. But the gusto exemplified by Keane's performance as Shylock and the gusto of Hazlitt's own response to it. A very interesting point here is this, that the, the great Victorian critic George Saintsbury, many, many, many years later, said, Hazlitt is the critic's critic which is a, a surprising thing in a way uh, for, for St. Speech to have said. Um, uh, what wonderful man who writes about uh, has a great deal, uh, uh, Bromwich, um, has pointed out that there is a connection between the kind of, of uh, criticism that Hazlitt did, which runs today into the review pages of the newspapers, and the kind of criticism that um, Coleridge did, which runs today into the academy. Uh, and what, what Sainsbury meant was that uh, Hazlitt was approaching the task of criticism, and therefore the task of reviewing Keane, as a, a sensitive, responsive, thinking, feeling human individual who was being thrilled by the moment of, of performance. He wasn't bringing any kind of academic theory to it, but he was responding to it uh, as, as a thinking, sensitive person. And it was the power of the, of the review, the gusto that came through the review, that uh, really captured the imagination of people who read it and had that transformative effect. Jonathan Bate and then I'll go to a yeah, I just think we, we do need to give listeners a sense of his wonderful style. He begins his, his review of a performance of Shakespeare's Coriolanus. Shakespeare has in this play shown himself very well versed in politics and human affairs. The person who reads Coriolanus, or sees Coriolanus, may as well save himself the trouble of reading Burke attacking the French Revolution or Paine defending the French Revolution, because Shakespeare gives you both sides of the argument. Then he says, the language of poetry, however, falls in with the language of power. A lion is a much more poetical object than the herd of wild asses that it is hunting. And then he goes on from there to talk about the fact that although Shakespeare in Coriolanus gives you both what he calls the aristocratic and the democratic point of view, gives you both Coriolanus and the people, in the end, the passion of poetry is more on the side of Coriolanus, of the aristocracy of power, which in terms of Hazlitt's politics is a difficult position to be in. So what happens in that essay is you have a brilliant 
brilliant reading of Shakespeare's play. You have an account of the actor. This, on this occasion, it was actually an actor called Kemble rather than Keane who was playing the part. Um, and you have Hazlitt grappling with great questions about aesthetics and politics. You get an awful lot for the price of one five-page essay. But I can I ask you, we're talking about essays. Mm -hmm. Are we talking about a time when poetry and essays were considered to be the two finest ways to express yourself, and the novel was not as highly regarded as these two uh, forms, uh, nothing like as highly regarded. And in the essay, Hazlitt could not only find a place in which he could put his vast, massive range of interests, as, <coughs> as Jonathan indicated a few minutes before, but reach the highest, uh, highest level of literary, uh, of lit uh, literary um, excellence of which he was capable. I think that's true. I think it was very much his genre, it's the genre which he brought to fruition. Um, and I think it's absolutely right that uh, we see it as a, a particular particularly romantic development, I think, in, in the essay. Hazlitt is inheriting the tradition of Montaigne, who's writing, uh, unlike his classical predecessors, much more informally, addressing his audiences uh, much more intimately. Uh, and then we have the 18th century essays, especially of Addison and Steele, which Hazlitt admired. And Hazlitt has that kind of easy, familiar style. But he's also... Um, Running through it all is a kind of um, is 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 a is a weight. Is this philosophical way of thinking? It's it's talking about familiar subjects, everyday life, uh, all often with great humour, with great uh, energy, but also with with a certain kind of seriousness. Um, and I think we should connect what Hazlitt is saying about familiar style with what Wordsworth is saying in the preface to Lyrical Ballads about about poetry, where poetry, he says, takes subjects from common life. It uses a language really used by men. These things, common life, the language really used by men, are in fact idealised by poetry. And there is a similar process of idealisation, I think, which goes on in Hazlitt's essays. It's interesting, <coughs> it's interesting when Hazlitt met Coleridge and Coleridge took him to meet Wordsworth, they read to him the lyrical ballads. He discussed the, the, the lyrical ballads with them then and said that he'd learned a great deal from Coleridge in particular about how to clarify his ideas. Indeed, he saw them in manuscript uh, and, uh, and immediately recognised them. This is a, says something about Hazlitt's powers as a, as a, a perceptive critic saw their value and their significance. But, he's, but he, he is never... This goes back to your point about Coleridge going into the academy and Hazlitt going into journalism. He's, he's, he's never as sort of ponderous and serious as Coleridge is. I, I mean, I don't think we want listeners to get the, the sense that because there are these philosophical ideas behind the essays, the essays are somehow heavy, because they're supremely light. I mean, his great essay, The Fight, where Bill Neat play, play, fights against the gas man down at Hungerford, I mean, this is the greatest sporting essay in the English language. And, and indeed was recognised as such by... Um, and there was a great heavyweight champion of the 1920s who, uh, after having had his head bashed a lot, uh, did, did a collection of essays on boxing and said in the preface to it, Hazlitt's essay on boxing is the greatest ever written. But nonetheless, he moves from the fight, doesn't he, to images from Dante's Inferno. Um, that's exactly... It's a very good example of how it is wonderfully light, but it is never just light. Um, and there's always that kind of anchoring of that everyday experience in some thing larger, I think. It should be mentioned that uh, Hazlitt's essays never begin with throat clearing. A hand comes out of the page, grabs you by the throat and <laughs> rushes you off uh, immediately. It's not so much throat clearing, is it? Throat strangling. Because his personal life infringed so much on, on not only his reputation but the work he did, let's turn to that. In, uh, he's he, he married uh, Sarah Stoddart, and by about 1820, that had cooled, and he was living in uh, that marriage had cooled. He was living in lodgings without her in Hoburn, and then he um, was besotted, infatuated, fell in love. What are we going to call it, Jonathan? This is a, a painful but fascinating story. Uh, his infatuation with his landlady's daughter, Sarah Walker. He was 18, and yeah, she was 18, and a little bit of a flirt, and it seems that the mother. Um, sent this girl in um, to flirt with all the young gentlemen uh, who lodged in this place in Southampton buildings in order to persuade them to stay there. And um, Hazlitt, uh, a, great, a great romantic, a great idealist, he, he, he absolutely fell crazily in love with this girl. And he, he sort of projected onto her um, an awful lot of feelings that 
in a sense, weren't provoked by her. Um, but it led him to, uh, to go off to Scotland, where it was easy to get a divorce, to, in order to divorce his wife, so that he could marry Sarah. But then he, he came back, and of course he discovered that she was doing just the same things with some of the other young gentlemen that uh, she, had, uh, she had done with him. And he then, foolishly, from the point of view of his now reputation... We're not, not, not just one, one second, before mm. we go to Libra Morris. The effect on him, as I've read, was drastic. I mean, Mary Shelley came back and said, I did not recognise him, his hair had fallen out, he was a... a we're talking a serious effect. Yeah, actually. it was terrible, yes. And, and it was th that, that uh, uh, quote from Mary Shelley that was very speaking. She said, if, if he hadn't smiled at me, I wouldn't have recognised him. He'd lost weight, he'd lost his hair. He was absolutely devastated by, by this experience. And it's quite important to, to put it into the context of, of Hazlitt's thinking about these matters and also his I emotional makeup, because he was one of those men who, who can't match the, the, the virgin and, and the, the maudlin, you know, the Madonna and the maudlin. There was a huge Some of us call it Magdalene, just. Just, just yes. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, of course, yes. So, so my college at Oxford, which is why I keep calling it that. Um, the, 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 the problem for him was that he was perfectly at home with uh, working girls and prostitutes, and he was never shy, as people weren't in the Regency period, about the fact that he uh, frequented prostitutes and so on. Um, but at the same time, girls who, and women who were of the middle class or upper class, uh, they terrified him. When he was a young man, he was very, very shy uh, about them. He idealised them. Uh, he was always in love with somebody or other, usually with... Uh, you know, a, a persona of a, played by an actress on the stage, and so when he met Sarah Walker, he was uh, over prepared in a way to project, as Jonathan says, all his idealizations and, and fantasies. And he'd written about this some years before, in a review of, uh, of um, Sigismondi on European literature. He had said things that later on Stendhal, his friend, picked up on uh, this idea of ideal, idealizing somebody and being prepared to fall in love with somebody because of your own fantasies about. Them. And perhaps as a way to get through it, as Jonathan was saying, I have to move on a bit quickly now, he wrote a memoir stroke novel called Liber Amoris, The Book of Love. Uh, this came out anonymously, everybody knew it was Hazard, and he was slated, and can you go in from there? Pimpled Hazlitt, people started calling him, and uh, the, the idea that uh, he'd fallen in love with this, uh, this tailor's daughter, the, the landlady's husband was a tailor, it, it ruined his, his, his reputation. It's, it's a book some people uh, still find quite painful to read because it is so raw, so honest about the, um, the, the, the way that falling in love can lead you into a kind of self-abasement. Um, although I actually think it, it's a more artful book than, uh, that, than that makes out. It, it, it copies, it transcribes some of his conversations with Sarah. It copies um, letters he wrote to, to his, his friends of, about his feelings. Um, but it does manage to construct them into a narrative. I mean, there's a, there's a narrative running through it where he gives her this little statue of Napoleon, his hero. So it is an artful work. In a way, it's in a tradition of confessional literature. It is experience reshaped as literature. But there's no doubt how much it damaged his reputation. What, what, one thing that happened, it gave the people who hated him in the conservative press at the time, uh, it gave them the chance to get him, uh, and they took it. Can you explain what that meant to his reputation and how they went about it? Well, the conservative press had been getting at him for some time. But they never uh, got him. They got him this time. Well, Hazlitt um, claimed that they did. For instance, he said his, his first major bestseller was characters of Shakespeare's plays, and he said um, it, it was selling rapidly till, till the Tory reviewers got at it, and then it then sold another copy, he says. So um, Hazlitt is, um, is, is attacked by the conservative press, and it ha had taken um, its, its toll on him uh, well before, I would say, the publication of Libra Morris. But Libra Morris, the problem was um, his friends couldn't defend it. The, I think um, it was a book that was deeply embarrassing to his friends. Um, it was it seized on with delight by, by, by the Tory press. And um, I think it was, it was all, all, it almost but not quite the, the nail in the coffin, I think. And the press was vicious at this time. You know, this yeah. is this is the the, exactly. the era where um, you know rival newspaper editors can get shot in duels and so on. And uh, as Otura says, um, uh, earlier Hazlitt's uh, characters of Shakespeare's play has, had been attacked by a Tory reviewer, and Hazlitt responds by describing him as the invisible link that connects literature with the police. 
<laughs> exactly right. Uh, and it, it's not at all paradoxical, I don't think, to say that some of the very, very best things that Hazlitt wrote, he wrote after this debacle, mm, uh, including, for example, the, the essays, some of the essays in the spirit of the age. Um, he lived only another seven years after the, the sort of end of this thing, because it was in, I think it was in 1823 when uh, he saw um, his, uh, his paramour walking down a Southampton Row with another man by whom she was made pregnant out of wedlock as it happens but uh, it, it was the, the sort of final uh, chapter of, of that very very sad event. I have to say by the way that um, when I was um, writing a biography about Hazlitt I went to America to have a look at the, what remains of the archive Hazlitt's letters and the originals of um, some of the letters that are reproduced in the Liberal Morris are uh, slightly different from, much bawdier than in some, some respects uh, the material that appeared in the book but they are so devastating, so moving, that one couldn't but weep over them. I mean, here was a man uh, of so rich in feeling and so destroyed by this experience that the illness that killed him, I think he died probably of stomach cancer in 1830, very probably began as a result of all the sturm and drang that, that happened at that time. But yet in those sort of twilight years, in a way, the twilight of his reputation anyway, when he travelled extensively uh, on the continent, spent a lot of time outside Europe, became very poor. It was in that time that some of his very, very best things were written. But nevertheless, just return to a point earlier, and if, if it's wrong, I wrong, do say so. His reputation did suffer badly from that, and although Antonis pointed out he wrote uh, some fine stuff after it, in, in terms of that, he, he became a disregarded figure and remained disregarded for quite a long time. His reputation has taken a long time to sort of to, to bring back up, hasn't it? Yeah, there's no doubt his, uh, his, his reputation took a hit. I mean, some of the late Victorian, early 20th century writers, like Robert Louis Stevenson thought very highly of his style. Until he read Liber Memoris and he threw it over it, the room and said he won't read Hazlitt again. Exactly. And then I think the other thing that Hazlitt suffered from was that the, the essay as a form fell rather into disrepute in the early 20th century. Hazlitt's cr close friend Charles Lamb became regarded as a rather whimsical, sentimental figure. So the academic critics of much of the 20th century um, really took against Hazlitt. David Lodge wrote a novel, 1984, uh, co called Small World, in, in which uh, there's a sort of risible scholar who works on Hazlitt, and, and th this is thought to be, you know, on only the kind of uh, smallest mind could possibly be interested oh in dear. Hazlitt. And yet, in the 20 years since then, David Lodge has been proved comprehensively wrong, because some of our great minds, and Tom Paulin has written a wonderful book on Hazlitt, and uh, the, uh, Michael Foote was a great Hazlitt fan. There's been a great revival in the last 20 years. And how would you say, Ottera, finally, his reputation stands now? I think it's higher than it has been in a very, very long time. I think, uh, especially as an essayist, um, but also as a political writer, um, and I think finally, at last, the worth of the Shakespeare criticism as well is really starting to emerge fully into view. So, died in poverty, happy ending. We well, so. I suppose... But as he was a materialist, <laughs> he won't know this. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he won't know. <laughs> Happily, we do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Uttara Nutterar John, uh, Jonathan Bate, and uh, Anthony Grayling. Next week, we're going to talk about the rise and fall of the Zulu nation. Thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.